Hello, and welcome to this discussion-based podcast on basic ECG interpretation. I'm Rashmi Patel. And I'm Ed Wallet. And in this podcast, we're going to go through the basics of how to interpret the ECG. Now, I think the key thing about trying to work out what's going on when you're presented with an ECG is to have a structured approach Absolutely. To, to interpreting it. Uh, so to summarise what, what you need to do, and we'll come back to this at the end as well, uh, the way I do it is to first of all check the patient's details and then look at the rate, then the rhythm and the axis, then look at the intervals. And by that I mean uh, looking at uh, the PR interval, the QRS interval, QT interval, uh, to see if there's any abnormalities there. Uh, and then look at, looking at the ST segments and the T waves to look for any abnormalities there. I, I think it's worth saying with this that often you won't get to the end of that list. Often you'll find an abnormality before you get to the end of your list. That's right. Um, yeah. And as you'll see in the way that we discuss basic ECG interpretation in this podcast, often it's not able to fit. You're not able to fit every single pathology into one of these specific categories. Often you'll come across one manifestation of, say, a tachycardia or a bradycardia right. in one aspect. Um, rather than later on. But if you're really struggling with an ECG, then you need this kind of systematic yes, approach. Yes, to, to, to work your way through it. Yeah. So, first of all, it's vital you check the uh, patient's name and it's the correct ECG you're looking at. And it's very easy, uh, particularly on an open ward where uh, several people have had ECGs, to end up looking at the wrong one. Yeah. And if you look at the wrong one, um, you could make terrible mistakes in patient's management. So it's very important that you check the identity. Um, ECG calibration, well, I wouldn't worry about this too much because um, it would be very unfair in an exam situation for you to be presented with one, one which is not calibrated in the standard way. Uh, but just to remember, the standard ECG calibration, the x-axis, uh, which is the time axis, one small square is equal to 40 milliseconds, and the y-axis, which is the voltage of the complexes, one centimetre or two large squares is equal to one millivolt. Um, you then go on to check the uh, rate, uh, the pulse rate, and there's two ways of doing this. Uh, if you're good at dividing numbers, then you take 300, and then you divide it by the number of large squares in between each QRS complex, uh, and that will get you the rate. Uh, but if you're not uh, good at dividing sums, and I'm not very good on the spot at doing division, then the other way you can do it is looking at the rhythm strip, uh, which should last 10 seconds. Uh, so in, th in that case, what you have to do is to just multiply the number of complexes on the rhythm strip by six, and that should get you the number in 60 seconds. Yep, and you can also just look at the top of the ECG. Um, now, the actual uh, working out the rhythm we'll discuss a bit later, uh, because there's a few things you need to look at. So we'll skip that for now, uh, and I'm going to talk uh, next about working out the axis of the ECG. Now, what do we mean by the axis? Well, the axis in, in broad terms is the overall vector of electrical depolarization uh, in, uh, in the ECG. And now this diagram looks a bit complicated. Uh, I'll just try and explain it as simply as I can. Each one of the uh, red uh, axes indicates a lead on the ECG and shows you the, the axis of that particular lead in relation to the um, complexes seen when you measure the ECG on those leads. So if you're looking at the overall axis, the easiest way to work out whether a patient has a normal axis or a left axis or right axis is to look at leads 1 and AVF because they're parallel to the X and Y axis uh, on this diagram. Now, what is a normal axis? Uh, well, normal axis is anything in the bottom right quadrant. Uh, uh, it can go a bit into the, into the top right quadrant as well, minus 15 degrees to, to plus 90 degrees. That's normal. Anything uh, to the left of that, so less than minus 15 degrees is left, and anything to the right of 90 degrees is right. So how do you work out whereabouts in these quadrants the, um, the axis is? Well, you need to look at the level of net deflection in leads 1 and AVF. So here's an example. In this uh, ECG, the net deflection in lead 1 is upwards, so a positive deflection, uh, whereas for AVF, uh, there's a net negative deflection. 
And the um, absolute values of the deflection is roughly equal. So you can see that the net negative deflection in AVF is roughly equal to the net positive deflection uh, in lead one. So if we go back to this diagram again, if you have a look at this, uh, you go across the positive part of, of one, the x-axis, and the negative part of AVF, and that will place you in the upper right-hand uh, quadrant, which is left-axis deviation. This is quite difficult to, to get your head around, so I suggest what you do is you actually take a look at several ECGs and sit yeah, down absolutely. and uh, have a look at this diagram and try, and try and get your head around it. There are other ways of doing it, looking at uh, leads two and three, but I, I personally find this the easiest way because it makes most sense to me yeah, uh, in terms of actually looking at the, uh, the axis. Okay. Okay, so after you've uh, had a look at the rate, the rhythm, and the axis, what you want to then look at are intervals. Now, there are lots and lots of different intervals that you can look at, and indeed you should know what those intervals are. However, most often you'll see derangements in either the PR interval or the QRS interval, and, and in some, sometimes even both. Um, you need to know that a normal PR interval should be less than 0.2 seconds and a normal QRS interval needs to be less than 0.12 seconds. If you see a PR interval that is greater than 0.2 seconds, you think about heart blocks, and we're going to talk about that a bit more in a second. If you see a QRS interval greater than 0.12 seconds, you need to think about ventricular rhythms, so that's rhythms of the heart that have their origin in the ventricles. We're going to talk in a bit about that in more detail. And you also need to think about this phenomenon of bundle branch block, um, which Rashby's going to talk about now. Okay, so here's a schematic diagram of the conduction system of the heart, uh, which illustrates the different pathways in the bundle of His uh, and in the ventricles, which uh, allow depolarization of the ventricles. Now, there are two main bundles in this electrical pathway, the left bundle and the right bundle. Uh, and the left one is also broken down into anterior and posterior, but we won't worry about that for the moment. We'll stick with left and right. So if you have an abnormality in the conduction pathway affecting either one of these uh, conduction pathways, uh, you will get a broadened QRS complex, as we've already said. Now, in order to work out the difference between uh, left bundle branch block and right bundle branch block, you then have to look at the morphology of the QRS complex. In other words, what it looks like in order to work out which is which. So let's start with right bundle branch block. Here we can see that the QRS complexes in this ECG are widened. Uh, and now if you particularly look at V1, you can see the classic characteristic uh, pattern of right bundle branch block, which is the RSR pattern. And if you see that in lead V1 uh, with a broadened QRS complex, then that is right bundle branch block. The next example is left bundle branch block, and here you can see the QRS complexes are widened, but the morphology is very different to what we saw with the right bundle branch block. Uh, in lead one, you can see that the QRS complexes are predominantly downward, uh, and in lead uh, V5 and V6, although um, I know it isn't very clear on this low resolution picture, uh, you can see an M pattern in, in the QRS complexes, and that is the typical pattern of left bundle branch block. Sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to, to work this out, and it isn't always clear. Um, and you may need to do serial ECGs and repeat the ECG maybe a couple of times to get a, a better tracing in order to, to work out what, what type of bundle branch block the patient has. Another important point to make is that if you have a patient uh, in bundle branch block, after you've um, got to the QRS complex, you can't really comment on the ST segments or T waves any further. Uh, so you should really stop there uh, once you've uh, diagnosed a bundle branch block. Yeah. So that nicely leads us on to a uh, brief conversation of the different types or the different important types of bradycardias and tachycardias. Obviously in the heart you can have a sinus bradycardia um, and that can be either for physiological reasons and for example in younger patients or very fit patients or can be for pathological um, situations, say for in patients who um, have hypothyroidism or who are taking various drugs such as uh, beta blockers. The two I want to focus on, however, are sick sinus syndrome, which is a problem with impulse formation in the sinus node, and the different types of heart block, which is a problem of 
um, impulse propagation within the heart tissue. So first of all, sick sinus syndrome. This is predominantly a condition of the elderly and is characterized by fibrosis of the sinoatrial node and often associated fibrosis of perinodal tissues. This leads to intermittent failure of impulse generation and can also cause failure of propagation because of the involvement of perinodal tissue. The features to look for are long pauses between P waves, typically greater than two seconds. Patients may also have a preponderance of ectopics, and the reason for this is they tend to develop other, um, si on other um, pacing sites within the heart, such as within the ventricles. They also are predisposed to the development of tachyarrhythmias, and for this reason, um, often sick sinus syndrome is referred to as tachybrady syndrome. So as I said, if there is a failure of impulse propagation, you then get a heart block. And there are three types of heart block to know about. First degree, second degree, and third degree. And third degree is often called complete heart block. So in first degree, you get just basically an, an increased PR interval. So the PR interval will be greater than two seconds. In second degree heart block, you can actually have two types. Type 1, which is also known as the Venkebach phenomenon, and type 2. In type 1, there is a gradually increasing PR interval that ultimately leads to a missed QRS complex or a missed beat. In type 2, the PR interval remains the same, so it's not gradually increasing. However, a proportion of P waves are not conducted successfully to give a QRS complex. This can either occur in a 2 to 1 or a 3 to 1 ratio. Finally, you can have complete heart block. Now the problem here is that atrial activity doesn't find its way down to the ventricles, so you end up getting a ventricular escape rhythm. Okay, and um, here we've got some examples uh, of these different types of heart block and what they would look like on the ECG. First degree heart block, as Ed has already mentioned, is where you have an increased PR interval uh, but otherwise uh, regular conduction, regular QRS complexes. In the type 1 or Wenckebach uh, rhythm, in second degree heart block, you have a gradually increasing uh, PR interval until a, a, a beat is missed uh, and then it resets back, back to the beginning. Uh, whereas in type 2, the uh, PR interval is constant, but you, have, uh, you may have two P waves per QRS complex, or, or sometimes even three, and in third degree heart block, the P waves are in no way correlated to the QRS complexes uh, and you have atrial activity and ventricular activity occurring independently. And as it's a ventricular rhythm, the complexes will be wide. Exactly. And there's an important point about severity here as well. Type 1 heart block actually can be not normal, but it doesn't cause any particular problems um, to That's the patient. Right. Yeah. However, as you go down from first, second to third, the um, severity of the heart block increases. And so, for example, Mobitz type 2 heart block and third degree heart block are both indications for pacing um, because right. yes. these conditions have a propensity to um, cause destabilization of the patient. That's right. Okay, now we've talked about bradycardias, moving on to tachycardias. Tachycardias can be broadly broken down into supraventricular and ventricular. Um, by uh, supraventricular and ventricular, that depends on whether the focus of the um, arrhythmogenesis is above or within the AV node, or whether it's in the ventricles. I'm going to first start off by talking about ventricular um, tachycardias. Now, as these are caused by a ventricular rhythm, the QRS complex is broad. So what you need to do in an ECG which uh, has an increased pulse rate is to see if the QRS complexes are narrow or broad. And if they are broad, then there's two possibilities here. It could be a ventricular tachycardia, uh, or uh, occasionally you can get supraventricular tachycardia uh, with associated bundle branch block, and it, sometimes it's actually quite difficult to distinguish between the two. Uh, I wouldn't worry about that too much. We'll just focus on the ventricular uh, tachycardias. Now that can be broken down into VT a ventricular tachycardia, or VF, uh, ventricular fibrillation, and torsade de pointe, uh, which uh, can occur as a result of long QT syndrome. And that uh, just describes a pattern of uh, altering amplitude 
uh, in the QRS complexes. Here is an example of a ventricular tachycardia. You can see here that the rate uh, is increased and that the QRS complexes are wide and regular. So this is a, a good example here of a ventricular tachycardia. And now I'm going to hand over to Ed to tell us a bit more about the supraventricular. Okay, so in supraventricular tachycardias, the characteristic are, of course, a tachycardia, but also the QRS complexes will be narrow. And this reflects the fact that the normal conduction fibres of the heart are being used. Broadly, you can divide them into irregular and regular. When we think about irregular tachycardias, the most common thing is atrial fibrillation. We're not going to talk in detail in this podcast about atrial fibrillation. There's another podcast um, on the website about right. this. Yeah. What we are going to speak a little bit about are the two particular types of regular narrow complex tachycardia. These are AVNRTs or AV nodal reentrant tachycardias and AVRTs or AV um, reentrant tachycardias. So, here is the first of two diagrams illustrating the difference between these two types. So, in AV nodal reentrant tachycardias, there is an accessory pathway within the AV node. This results in the setting up of a localized circuit that allows the heart to continually generating impulses to the ventricles, which of course leads to a tachycardia. In the other situation of AV reentrant tachycardia, there's the existence of a secondary pathway between the atria and the ventricles. And this allows continued activation from the atria to the ventricles. This is particularly a problem in the situation where a patient goes into atrial fibrillation, because in this situation, fibrillating impulses from the atria go down to the ventricles and indeed can cause ventricular fibrillation. That's right, because it's effectively directly connected, isn't it? What the... Exactly, yeah. exactly. <clears throat> the most important example of an AV reentrant tachycardia is a syndrome called Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, which is shown in this ECG. Um, this ECG actually doesn't show a tachycardia, and many patients with Wolf Parkinson White syndrome won't have, or certainly won't have tachycardias all the time. They'll have um, episodic um, periods when they'll develop them. However, you should be aware of the important ECG features for Wolf Parkinson White um, syndrome. And these are best shown, I think, in uh, leads 1 and uh, V3, or what's called C3 on this particular slide. The most importantly are a shortened PR interval and a delta wave. And that corresponds to the appearance of the QRS complex, which looks like the Greek symbol for delta. That's right. quite characteristic. Isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Having looked at the um, intervals and the QRS complex, you then move on to look at the ST segments and the T waves. Firstly, considering the ST segments, well, they can either be normal or they can be elevated or depressed. Now, ST elevation uh, can be a very significant finding in patients who present with acute coronary syndrome because that could indicate an acute MI. And it's very important to remember that if you see a patient with ST elevation on their ECG, you must always consider an MI, the exactly. most important thing yeah, to consider. Very important. Um, other possibilities include pericarditis, and this can um, result in, in sort of widespread uh, non-specific ST elevation across all leads in the ECG, not related to a particular anatomical area of the heart, um, or um, something called high takeoff, where you get the appearance of ST elevation owing to the fact that the baseline uh, looks as if it's elevated into the um, uh, into the T wave, but in fact, uh, it's not actually classic uh, ST elevation as you might find in an acute MI. Right, now, ST depression. The most important um, diagnosis uh, relating to ST depression is cardiac ischemia. Uh, and often you can find uh, areas of uh, ischemia in the resting ECG in people who have uh, chronic angina, yeah. or um, you can induce ST depression uh, in exercise, and this is the principle of the exercise tolerance exactly, test in yeah. order to try and see if someone uh, has uh, myocardial ischemia. Another cause of ST depression is uh, the patient taking digoxin, and this classically results in what's called the reverse tick morphology, which is uh, exactly what it sounds like. It looks like a reverse tick sign uh, on the ECG. Now, the T waves. 
Again, the T waves can either be normal or they can be inverted or they can be uh, peaked. Uh, but we'll just focus here on T wave inversion. Now, occasionally it can just be normal variant. You can get uh, T wave inversion in AVR and V1 yeah. uh, and it's completely normal. Completely. Yeah. Uh, however, uh, it, as, as before, it's important to consider ischemia uh, as a cause of ST uh, wave, uh, sorry, as, as a cause of T wave inversion, particularly if it's something which is new and you can check that by comparing with previous ECGs. Mm -hmm. Uh, or it can result uh, due to ventricular hypertrophy, for example, left ventricular hypertrophy uh, resulting in what's classically called the uh, strain pattern, where you get large voltages in the chest leads uh, alongside T-wave inversion. It can also occur as, as a result of bundle branch block, and you remember I said earlier that if you find uh, left or right bundle branch block in the ECT, you can't really say anything mm -hmm. about the uh, ST segment or T-waves. Uh, and it can occur as a result of dichoxin as well. And this is the prime example of what you don't want to miss. Absolutely. So this is an example, say this is a patient who has chest pain, he's coming with chest pain, a history of uh, chronic stable angina, and as you can see, this ECG shows gross ST elevation in 2, 3, and AVF. This is the characteristic inferior MI. However, there's more to note on this ECG as well, isn't there, Ashwin? Absolutely, and if you look... Um, in the chest leads, you will also notice that there is ST depression, uh, particularly uh, in V2 and V3. And these are what's called reciprocal changes, uh, which occur um, as a result of uh, having had the inferior MI. Now, what actually causes them is actually uh, debated. Some people think it's because you're looking at the uh, ECG from, from the other side of the heart. Uh, another alternative uh, hypothesis is that what you're seeing is a level of ischemia um, across uh, anteriorly and laterally, uh, which is occurring at the same time that the patient has had their inferior mm -hmm. infarct. So this ECG, the two main points here, which you really want to uh, make sure that you, you, you can identify are the ST elevation in 2, 3 and AVF, and that indicates an acute inferior myocardial infarction, and the reciprocal changes uh, in the chest leads, V2 and V3. Absolutely. And this is just some um, further reading that we thought we'd put in. These are two incredibly useful books uh, written by John Hampton on the basics of the ECG. They go through the most important principles with good examples and things, and especially the first book, The ECG Made Easy. I, I highly recommend that. Definitely. If you want to practice your interpretation of ECGs, there's an excellent resource, www.ecglibrary.com, um, that can provide you with uh, plenty of, of good examples of all of the different cardiac pathologies. Right, and now coming back to where we started, just to summarise what we've talked about in this podcast about uh, basic ECG interpretation, uh, as with all things uh, in medicine, you want to have a structured approach, and the same is true of the ECG. So when you're presented with an ECG, you want to check the patient's details and make sure that you're looking at the right patient's ECG. And then you look at the rate, uh, if it's fast or slow uh, or normal, and the rhythm, uh, and then look at the axis to see whether it's left axis or right axis deviation or, again, normal axis. And then the intervals, uh, we talked in particular about looking at the PR interval uh, in order to look for signs of heart block and the uh, QRS uh, duration in order to look for signs of uh, bundle branch block or a ventricular rhythm. And then after you've looked at the uh, QRS complexes to then move on to the ST segments and the T waves, and in particularly, uh, particularly with the ST segment, looking for ST elevation, which could indicate an acute uh, myocardial infarction. Okay, so that's it. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Um, Thank you very much. And we'll see you soon.